look at this. It's a spectrograph. I'm going to use it to test my astrophotography filters. I made it myself using an astrophotography guide camera, a CCTV lens, a razor blades and diffraction grating whose parts you can get for less than $200. You also need a fluorescent light bulb and broad spectrum LED bulb for measurement as well as a box to put everything together. If you are into astrophotography, you may already have the camera and the cost may be significantly cheaper, probably around $30 to $40 total. Let's see how good the results are. Can I measure the peak transmission and bandwidth of my astrophotography narrowband filters? How precise can it be? Is it accurate enough to measure down to five nanometers, one nanometer? And how much tinkering does it take to get right? Let me show you how I made it, how I used it, and how accurate I could get it, as well as explore some other options. Welcome to Deep Sky Detail. I'll list links to all the parts in the description and pinned comment. First, you'll need an astrophotography guide camera or a web camera, but the guide camera will be a lot more accurate. I'm using a Mallencam guide camera. I don't think that they sell this particular model anymore, but SV Boney does sell a clone of it. The camera has an adapter that you can mount CCTV lenses to, which is the second thing you'll need. I picked up this five to 50 millimeter CCTV lens on Amazon for around 20 US dollars. You'll need a diffraction grating. You can sacrifice a CD or DVD to get its diffraction grating, or just buy a couple dozen for around $15 on Amazon. It'll make life so much easier. Go for the 1000 lines per millimeter and not the 13,500 lines per inch. The 1000 lines per millimeter should give you better resolution. You're also going to need some sort of box or container and a couple of razor blades. For the box, I found a 3D print on Thingiverse by user MHX. It makes things really easy, but you can use anything as long as you're able to have a slit in the box that can project light onto the diffraction grating and have the camera stably focused on the grating. The final design is up to you, and I suspect that you'll be able to adapt the design based on materials that you have at home. So let's open up my spectrometer to see what's inside. At the front of the box angled is the slit opening. So I don't know if you can see this here. There's the slit here. And in front of the slit, I put a one and a quarter inch telescope nose piece adapter. This just allows me to screw in my astrophotography filters on the front to test how well they work. But you'll notice in between the barrel and the larger slit, are the razor blades. So these two things, not sure if you can see them, these are the razor blades. I put the sharp ends of the razor blades together to make a smaller slit and aligned it to be in the center of this bigger slit here. So again, the 3D print has a big slit and then right in the middle are, are the razor blades with a smaller slit. To get really accurate measurements, you want the razor blades to be as close as they can without, without covering up the gap. I just glued one of the razor blades to cover up one half of the slip and then position the other razor blade as close as possible to it without, without closing it up. I kind of take it off a couple of times to make sure things are actually really, really close, but just be careful, razor blades are sharp. So if you're doing this with razor blades, just keep that in mind and be warned that razor blades are sharp. If you don't want to use razor blades, then you might be able to get some cardstock and paint it black and then put that very close together and make a slit with that. But it might not be as accurate or there are slits that you can buy, but they're generally pretty expensive. So the light shines in through the nose piece, goes through the slit and hits the diffraction grating here. This right here is a telescope adapter. It's a two inch to one and a quarter inch adapter. This just allows me to put in the uh, the lens and the camera. So I'll go ahead and take the lens out so you can see that. So this is the lens. It just screws on to the camera. So this particular camera has an adapter for a CS mount. You just screw that into the camera then screw the lens into that. And then there are three knobs here. Um, this first one determines how zoomed in you are. This one controls the iris or the, I guess it's the diaphragm. So it determines how much light actually gets 
into the sensor. And then this is just the focus knob here. And then we put this in here and I can lock it with this screw here. Of note, I think that the zoom is somewhere in between the five to 50 millimeters of had to guess. I'd say it's around 20 to 30 millimeters. Other, uh, otherwise, I can't really get it to focus being so close. And I think it's generally fine. Also, you, you kind of want to have it stop down a little bit. You don't want to have the aperture all the way open. I think it just makes things a little bit easier and like makes things a little bit more precise. Take this out a second. I did use Velcro and a piece of tile to connect the box to, so the whole apparatus to. And that's just because when I'm screwing and unscrewing the eyepiece here, I don't want this thing moving around. And so having a little bit of weight at the bottom really helps things out. Uh, you'll notice on the outside, I put some tin foil. That's just to help keep all that extra light out so you get more accurate measurements. You could also use black filament or paint the whole thing black if you wanted to. I was a little bit lazy and I thought I would just put some tin foil over it and it works okay. So let's go ahead and put the camera back in and we will set this up and calibrate things so we can start measuring. Okay, let's talk about calibration for a second. Theramino spectrometer is a great piece of software, but the hardest part I think is going to be doing calibration. But even that isn't too bad. What you need is a fluorescent light bulb like this one. When you turn the bulb on, mercury vapor starts to glow in UV light inside the tube. UV light is of course invisible to us. So different compounds are added inside the tube that absorb the UV light and radiate it into light that we can see. The light that the compounds radiate at are emission lines. We need to tell Theramino spectrometer the location of two of the peaks on the diffraction grating. Ideally, we could just tell it two peaks one in the purple part of the spectrum and one in the red and be done with it. But our lens and setup in general is not good enough for that. It will be close to being calibrated, but the peaks won't line up exactly. There's probably some field curvature and miscollimation going on. So if I want to analyze the wavelength around 500 nanometers, then we should choose two peaks around 500 nanometers that aren't too close together, but aren't super far apart. And a fluorescent lamp is great for this. It has several peak wavelengths from 400 nanometers to 800 nanometers, as seen on this Wikipedia Commons page. I'm going to be choosing peaks three and five corresponding with 487.7 nanometers and 546.5 nanometers respectively. Once calibrated for the correct wavelength, you can switch out another light source that is stronger in that part of the spectrum if you need to. Just remember that different parts of the spectrum need to be calibrated separately. So a 500 nanometer narrowband filter should be calibrated using two emission lines around it. And a 656.3 nanometer filter should be calibrated using a different set of emission lines surrounding that, like 15 and 18 on the Wikipedia page. Now, it is a little bit more complicated than that. Once you choose the two emission lines, you're going to want to line up as many peaks as possible. And it can be a little bit finicky. And I'll go over that now. I'll be using Theramino Spectrometer. Which is, it's a free, amazing app to do the spectrography. I'll leave a link to it in the description. The web page that you download it from is actually very long with a lot of different Theramino software. So you may have to go looking for it, but it is there. Before using the program to get everything set up initially, I'm going to use my guide cameras application because it is easier to use. This here is a fluorescent light bulb right here. I'm pointing to it with my finger. Um, and I find that the warmer fluorescent light bulbs do better than the cooler fluorescent light bulbs. You can see the emission lines needed to calibrate with them better for it. So just keep that in mind. But I'm going to aim the slit at uh, the light bulb. So let's go ahead and connect the guide camera and turn on the light bulb. You'll notice that I haven't put the top on it yet. And that's intentional because I'm going to be messing with the stuff inside of it. Now, now the camera is working. You can see sort of the emission lines here. We want to get the spectrum as straight as possible and we want to get it as focused as possible initially because that'll make everything easier in Theramino. And we want to align the camera and focus it. First, I'll focus it by turning the focus knob. Okay, that's pretty focused for now. Uh, we also want to turn the camera to see if we can get those rainbow lines to go straight up and down. OK, so this is a color camera, which is nice. You can tell that the uh, blues and the purples are on the left and that the reds are on the right, which is 
which is what we want for the software. And there we go. We've got some we've got the spectrum showing up. OK, so now let's go ahead and open up Theorem, you know, spectrometer, and we can go ahead and close this application. Nice. All right. This is good. Let's go ahead and put the top back on and we will start to calibrate everything. All right, so we've got a uh, Theramino spectrometer open now and, and made sure my camera is chosen from the drop down menu here. So you can see it up here and I've chosen the Malin cam, which is the camera that I want. We can control the exposure length and things using uh, the video input controls. So if we go here, we can increase the exposure or decrease the exposure. We can also slightly adjust the spectrometer to make sure we see as many peaks as possible. So if we wanted to, we could change this and to turn it just a tad bit, turn it left or right to make sure that the slit is pointed as squarely as possible onto the lamp. This black box right here is what the camera sensor sees. Keep in mind that it is stretched horizontally. We only need a small sliver of what it sees. So this is the full view. We only need a small horizontal sliver of this piece to get the best measurements. To do that, we can change the size Y parameter here, and I'm going to make it 50. 50 seems like a good, uh, good option. Do you see how the emission lines now pop up as straight lines? That's what we want to see. We can also move the start Y parameter to see which part vertically on the sensor it's going to be looking at. Generally, somewhere in the middle I find is pretty good. So I know that my camera is 960 pixels in height. So somewhere around 400, 450 is good. So at this point, the spectrometer is starting to look like what the Wikipedia page looks like, but we can fine tune things. We have to actually calibrate everything anyway. So let's decrease the exposure time a bit and adjust the focus. Go ahead and adjust the focus over here. OK, that looks pretty good. Now the peaks are kind of starting to show up a lot better, but it's still not calibrated. So what we need to do is go to tools trim points and fluorescent 436 and 546. Now the trim points themselves will show up on the Y axis up here in yellow. 546 is one that we want to keep. So let's move it over to where the Wikipedia page says it should be. So I'll move this one over and then move the 546 over to this very tall peak here. You can use your mouse wheel to zoom in and then just place it right there. Now 436 is a bit too far away from 500 nanometers. So I'm going to use this peak down here, which is around 487 nanometers as my second point. So I'm going to zoom in until I see 487 and then you can click and drag around. And the emission line is 487.7. So it's right here. If we right click on the X axis up here, not down here, but up here here on the, on the x-axis, it'll ask you to add a new trimming point. We say yes, and then we can zoom out and right click on the 436, this original trimming point, right click on it, delete that one. So we know that the 487 peak is supposed to be here. So let's go ahead and zoom in just a little bit and then drag it over to about where the peak should be. We can zoom in as far as we want. And I'm going to say it's about right here just initially. Everything seems calibrated, but as a gut check, we should also check the peak at 611 nanometers because that's also a very strong peak. Theramino says that it should that right now it's around 617 nanometers, which is wrong. Because the optics aren't perfect, there's probably some field curvature and chromatic aberration going on. And this will affect where it says our peak of the filter is. The blue end of the spectrum is more affected by the lens imperfections than the green and the reds. So let's adjust the, the peak on the left, this 488 one, and move it slightly until we see that this peak over here shows 611. You'll notice too that these peaks, these smaller peaks around 580, also start to match up what the what to what the Wikipedia page says. That's a good sign. We should be pretty calibrated by now. I'm going to use an LED light to measure the 035 five nanometer filter that I have. I'm going to do that because there isn't a lot of light coming from the fluorescent bulb around 500 nanometers. We can change it out with this one in order to get more signal in that area of the spectrum. And it shouldn't mess up our calibration. Let me do that right now. All right, I've got the light bulb switched out now. Uh, you can see it here. And what I'm going to do now is click background. And this tells Theramino that everything right now is just background noise. 
We can go ahead and turn on the light. If we zoom out, we see the full spectrum that this LED puts out and we can go ahead and click on reference. So this normalizes all of the wavelengths and this and the software pretends that each wavelength has the same intensity. So I'm going to slowly place the filter on the eyepiece adapter, being careful to try and not move the spectrometer very much because that will mess up the reference, this reference graph. So the center of this filter should be around 500 nanometers. If we've done calibration okay, we should get that. Look at that, we're already at around 500 nanometers. So uh, we probably need to focus the, let me bring this over here so you can see it. We probably need to focus this a little bit more because uh, we need to focus at each part of the wavelength that we're looking at to get the best measurement. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that right now. So it looks like we've got in focus. The, the peak is right around where it should be, um, but we can probably check the full width half maximum pretty well. Uh, so let's zoom in a second. And about half of the intensity, so at half of this peak, if we look at the y-axis here, is probably around 850. We can check and see that we're at 498 nanometers on the left side and 503, 504 on the right side. So that's a difference about five and a half. That's pretty good. I've tried this with other O3 filters and I've got similar results. So a 12 nanometer and with O3 filter had a peak around 500 nanometers and a width of around 12 nanometers. I did the same thing with a three nanometer bandwidth filter and it gave similar results. Admittedly, this setup, while good, takes a lot of tinkering. And I've seen some spectrometers on eBay go around for $120. I'm not sure they would be as good as this one, though. I would expect that the camera is just a simple web camera inside the boxes and they're not as good as the ones that I used, but I could be wrong. There is also the Sol X setup that runs about 750 US dollars, but it has the added benefit of being able to shoot images of the sun. Is this perfect? No, I think that this spectrograph will be best used for measuring the full width half maximum of your filters. It can be very good at that when you have good calibration. However, it is less accurate at, deter at determining where the peaks are. I think on average, it can be off as much as three nanometers. If you have excellent calibration, then it can be spot on, but you're going to need something more than just a fluorescent light bulb to calibrate it. You may need specific monochrome light bulbs to calibrate things, perfectly. Also, I haven't figured out how to determine peak transmission. So are the filters letting in 90% of HA light? Are they letting in 80%? I don't yet know how to do it with just this software. Having said that, for $40, you can really get some interesting results and test your filters pretty well. Also, I'd like to thank my Buy Me A Coffee members and channel members for all their support. I'll soon be doing a review of some five nanometer and three nanometer filters, as well as comparing how much better it is going from a 12 nanometer filter to a five nanometer filter. So make sure that you're subscribed so you don't miss those. If you enjoyed this video, you may also enjoy the video where I review SV Boney's dual narrowband HA oxygen three filter here, or you may enjoy this video that the algorithm recommends. Thanks for watching.